All right. Want to be a better programmer is a great title. First of all, I want to introduce Casper, uh, my colleague. I do you want to introduce me? I can do that. This Good. is Lars. You, you probably heard all you need to know about him already, so uh, let's stop right there. Too much. Yeah. So um, before we start, we'll just recap some of the stuff um, Dave said. Uh, we've been doing virtual machines, high-performance virtual machines, for many, many years. Uh, I started working on the beta programming language 30 years ago. You all know beta, right? Two, wow, five. Three. Three. Four, five, yes. Pretty good. Um, but it's been fun. Uh, so the first uh, 25 years uh, was spent on making them fast and small and dynamic. Um, and that's the reason why you have, I guess, to some effect, can rely on dynamic class loading and polymorphic inline caching and what have you. The um, last five years, we worked on Dart, and uh, this talk will be related to Dart mostly. Mm -hmm. Um, but what I want to tell you about the thread throughout the, um, the, at least my career, has been to empower programmers so they can do abstractions at no cost. It's super important that programmers, when they scale the application, they're not forced to flatten out, remove functions, and, and basically turn the implementation inside out to make it fast. So it's always been important for all these systems we built that if you add abstractions, we will inline it and make it no cost. I worked with Casper the last uh, 16 years. Yeah. So that has been fun. Uh, so he's been trained and he's probably better than me now. <laughs> um, but we got, um, when we joined, when we joined Google uh, nearly 10 years ago, we started building the V8 engine. I hope you heard about JavaScript. Uh, but when we joined, it was very, very slow. And our task was to make it uh, much faster. So uh, we came up with a way to make it object-oriented. And um, then we knew how to make it fast. So that's how V8 came about. And uh, it turns out that V8, at this point, is used for everything. It's used for Node.js. Uh, even the Agamas programming environment is built on top of V8, which is scary but true. And we have a lot of browsers um, that are also using technology. The best part about this system here was it was uh, open sourced. So uh, competitors, browser competitors, they had to at least match the performance. Otherwise, they looked like they couldn't uh, do JavaScript. So I think this friendly open competition for JavaScript has created the world we have today with browsers that are across the board very fast. And I'm very pleased with that. So one, one question you can ask yourself is that did this sort of performance improvement that we, we delivered um, as a sort of a combined ecosystem, did that really make you all better programmers? I think that's a good question to ask. So I, I went searching online for finding out how people use JavaScript today. And um, you find code like this. I don't know if you can read it from the, from the back. I, I hope so. Um, it's very hard to tell what that does. Um, Clearly, it doesn't quite work. There's a weird assignment there. We assign 0 to i inside the loop. And it's, this is the kind of code you still find around. There's just something rotten about that. And it gets, it gets worse, right? You can find so much extremely poor code in JavaScript out there. And um, you find things like people want to figure out if uh, something is a function they'll use, like two-string conversion, slicing and dicing, yeah. and trying to figure out if, um, if this is a string. So I think you can ask yourself, like, does performance in itself really make you guys better programmers? Um, I think the answer is a resounding yes, of course it does. Clearly, we did. I think we did it. We made you all much better programmers. Not. Um, I, there's, there's something missing here. Um, and that's what we want to try to dive into in, in this, uh, this talk. So like, we, d we both uh, live and breathe performance. And it's, uh, it's a whole lot of fun to try to make uh, code run fast. But it's not everything, um, so that's what we want to try to cover. I don't think the uh, the fact that we made JavaScript faster on the on the web was a, a wasted effort at all. Um, 
Like it does enable a lot of innovation. We've seen very, very cool things come out of that, that, that thing. Richer frameworks, better abstractions like Lars was telling about. And much, much lighter applications are now running online uh, and on top of a, a infrastructure like Node.js. It is though true that developers are still su sort of suffering from somewhat puzzling semantics and, and very hard to identify errors in their code bases. There's no, almost like no declarative syntax anywhere. It's very hard to find dependencies. It's a very sort of um, loose, relaxed, keep on trucking kind of a system that we have. Errors are sort of consumed by the system, absorbed even, and people uh, and the system may sort of implicitly converts values in weird ways all the time as part of the core programming model. So not a wasted effort, but there is something missing here. All right. So um, it's great to have a fast JavaScript engine. People start making more and more source code, and they figure out it's very hard to manage it. So what do they do? What they always do. They come up with uh, preprocessor or compilers that will take another source language and compile it to JavaScript. And uh, I think most big companies are good, uh, guilty in creating one of these uh, transpilers. And you can see a list here. You have TypeScript, CoffeeScript, Cylon, Scala.js, Hex, Elm, uh, ClojureScript, Gwit, Closure Compiler, and even Dart now translates also to JavaScript. And it's interesting. And the whole thing stems from that it's really hard to manage a, a large code base in JavaScript. So the reason why we're here uh, is to tell you that we might not be able to make you smarter, but we can help building some systems that will make you more productive as a programmer. And what we believe uh, is that simplicity, simplicity and consistency in the programming language and the frameworks you're using will help you make you a better programmer. So uh, what we'll cover in this talk here, we'll talk about uh, simplicity and consistency with the programming language, talk about uh, some issues with JavaScript and Java and C++ compared to Dart. We actually learned from the past in designing the Dart programming language, I think. And the second one will show you an example of a framework that actually tries to also be simple and consistent. Yeah, why don't we start with the, uh, with the language part? Um, I think this is the right quote to start with, um, and clearly the right guy to deliver it. Um, shouldn't listen to us, you should listen to Bruce Lee instead. But simple language semantics is really important to make uh, people productive and uh, make people write better and cleaner code. Um, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with that. Um, raise of hands. Right? Fairly few people. Oops. Was that a comment on that? No. Uh, I'll, I'll walk you through what, what, uh, what, what Dart is. Uh, it's, it's actually fairly simple. Um, it's an unsurprising object-oriented language. It's based on classes. Uh, it does come with support for interfaces and mix-ins. It's very familiar syntax with curly braces and everything you would expect from a sort of a language derived from the C school of thought. Um, it's uh, kept simple through a single-threaded model with um, isolate or actor-based concurrency, and it comes with optional static types here. There are quite a number of differences in, uh, sort of on this slide from, from JavaScript, but uh, I'm just curious, how many people here know JavaScript? Hmm, I thought so. How many know it really well? <laughs> uh, there are people that have raised their hands. I, I like that. So I'm going to need a volunteer. Oh, just back up a little bit. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. One thing we forgot to tell you guys is that um, if you don't translate Dart to JavaScript, but run it on the, its native virtual machine, it's actually twice as fast as JavaScript. So if you want speed, it's an option. Sure. Go on. I'm still going to need a volunteer. So in JavaScript, you can do interesting things with fairly simple operators like the equality operator. And I just need someone to tell me what will this evaluate to in JavaScript. Any volunteers? It should be easy. No? Nothing? I'll pick you then. Oh, OK. Yeah, I recently read the ECMAScript 262 standard version 5.1. And if you go to paragraph 11193, you will find the um, abstract equality comparison algorithm. And there you will find a very complicated way of computing this. 
It turns out what happens is first expression, you're comparing 2.0 to the string 2, it will try to convert the right hand side to a, a number. So the string will be converted into the number 2, and the first expression will return true. Then we have true equals new Boolean true. Now, here's the hint. In JavaScript, there's values and objects, two different things. So true is not the same as new Boolean of true. But if you look at this uh, paragraph I talked about before, you'll figure out that you will then have to convert the Boolean to true, Boolean true to a primitive type, which is true. So we have true equals true, it returns, returns two, true. And then you have true equals the string one. That's simple, because in the first few comparisons, we converted the right-hand side to something else. But that's not true when you have true equals a string. Then you first convert the left-hand side to true, and that will be converted to a number, which is one. And then you have a number one compared to the string one. And again, you then convert the right-hand side, the string one, to one. And then one equals one is true. And the result is true. You all knew that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. It's interesting. At least I feel like this is more than enough sort of implicit conversions happening behind the scenes to make my head explode. The thing is, this actually happens in real code. Not intentionally. You probably will not write expressions like this very often. Um, but these kind of conversions happening behind the scenes just because you're unaware of how things work out, it's kind of painful, to say the least, I think. So that is an attempt to try to fix some of these things. It's an open standard. Um, and it has been since 2013. We've gone through a number of revisions. And we'll walk through, uh, through a few of the things we've added over the years. Um, but it is, uh, it's also uh, governed by the, the ECMA committee that over also sort of oversees the, um, the, uh, the evolution of, of ECMAScript. Maybe you'll talk about uh, something else, Lars. Oh, yeah. So we have a small section here about constructors. We all use constructors create, to create new instances of classes. And uh, most people believe semantics is clear for different programming languages. So I took the liberty of trying a, different, a few different object-oriented languages to see what actually happens. So let's, uh, let's go at it. So I decided to look at three different languages, C++, Java, and Dart, and see how constructors work. I'm only looking at a particular aspect of it, but the situation is very simple. We have two classes, a class A and a class B. B is a subclass of A, and they both have virtual uh, methods, all, both called F, and constructors of A will call F, and constructors of B will call F2. And then we'll see what happens when you execute in these different languages. I did not include JavaScript and Smalltalk because they don't really have constructors. You have to do everything by hand, and that's even worse. So um, let's go at it. Here are uh, the constructors in C++. I hope you can read C++. It's very simple. You have an include, you have a class A and a class B, and um, then the A constructor calls F, and F is a virtual function that prints out A. And B uh, also has a constructor that calls F, and a function F, all right, that prints out B. And you have the main function, and you create an instance of B. What happens? It will print out A and B. And you'll wonder why, since it just have one instance, and why is it not a B in the two cases? It is because in C++ they have chosen that when you evaluate the constructor of A, you have not initialized the B portion, so you can only see what an A instance could see. But this actually might be confusing to, to people, and it surprises the most mm -hmm. when they try it out. In Java, they sort of solved it. You have a class A, again, it's exactly the same uh, scenario, except that you have to wrap the, the main in a, in a class, which is pretty annoying. Um, and you say new B, and uh, it will then 
execute the constructor of B, first by executing the body of the constructor of A, and then uh, afterwards uh, the body of constructor of B. And you are lucky. In this case, uh, it's the same word you're calling. It prints out B and B. This is what you expect, and you are sort of happy. Sort of. Let's see how we can expand this example just a little bit. In red, you'll see I added a final string X, and its values will be set to B, the string. This is cool. Uh, final means that that field will only have one value ever, and I really mean ever. And we run the program again, and as you expected, you get B and B out. So this is behaving like expected. So to pay careful uh, attention to the red line. Now I'm going to make a small change to the program. I will say string.trim. I don't think it's going to matter much in terms of functionality since there's no spaces around the B. But what does it print out? Any takers? It'll print out the same, right? Casper? Well, I mean, it, it really should, right? I mean, it's a final variable. You would expect that to always have one value, and this should be B. So yes, it should be B. But so I, I know it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it prints null. It prints null, of course. And you take us, why is it null? Oh, of course. The reason why this is printing out null is that in the previous one, where the right-hand side is a constant, the Java C compiler will inline it. So this is actually not a real field, and then it behaves like expected. If it's a real field, like in this case, and the right-hand side is, is uh, computed when you initialize the B portion, you will not have initialized the B portion when invoking the if uh, method uh, in the constructor of A. And that surprises people. And this is a real problem in my mind, because you have a final field, and you get two different values out of it, first null and then the real string. And, and this also happens in, in real code, and it's the kind of issue that's really annoying to track down. Like, actually having final fields and being able to observe that their values change over time is not a pretty thing. So, Anyways, um, I give you these examples to show that when we designed the Dart programming language, we, we tried to learn from the past. So when you run the same code in Dart, please note that the code in Dart is shorter than in any of the other programs. Um, but you get B and B. And um, any combination will uh, yield uh, that same result. And the reason for that is we decided to have clean constructor semantics. We decided to split up the uh, constructor evaluation in two parts. First one is to initialize all the fields. And the second uh, pass, just uh, evaluate the body of the constructors. This might seem like a simple thing, but you get the consistency we're looking for. You are not surprised uh, by what the programming language is doing. And when you debug, you know exactly uh, what to expect, basically. So uh, this is uh, one of the issues we talk about when, when going for a cleaner semantics that will make you a better programmer. Finally, uh, we also, this is just like an add-on, uh, in addition to the constructor semantics I explained before, uh, we can have factory constructors. So unlike in Java, where you, uh, you are sort of bound to returning uh, the instance the system creates for you, you can cheat in, um, in Dart. And in this example here, we have a simple class, and the constructor will take a string and return a simple. But these uh, symbols are canonicalized, so sometimes it will return um, 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 a, a symbol that has been created uh, a while back. So this is a complete implementation of a simple table in Dart, which is uh, uh, not that complicated. And it shows that uh, you'll get 
uh, you create two new symbols and you will get exactly the same if the string is equals. That's it. So um, let's go to boilerplate code in programming languages. Yeah, I actually want to go to the, the uh, at least an attempt to, um, to go for uh, like the lack of boilerplate. But I think everybody who writes code for a living um, has to um, be willing to write a certain amount of boilerplate, but it's very painful for all of us. One thing is writing it, the other thing is actually reading it as well. Some people argue that you just need a good tooling experience in your ID that will just fill out this stuff for you, but it still come, comes with a tax. Right? You have to pay for reading it and understanding it over and over and over again. We really need to try to avoid some of that. So I'm going to do some comparisons between Dart and Java. And uh, the two languages are fairly alike in many ways. Uh, and we just try to make things more concise and uh, better sort of capturing the intent of what you want to do instead of being sort of garbled up in, in too much ceremony. So here's a, an example of this. In Dart, you have the ability to write very simple constructors that just feed values um, that are passed to the constructor into fields. Um, you can, of course, do the same thing in Java. It just takes more writing. Dart is not the only language in the world to have these kind of features, but I think it's really important that you, you uh, aim to make simple constructors really easy to express. And we found, actually, that by allowing people to, uh, to have this shorthand notation for writing these kind of constructors, people tend to prefer writing really simple constructors. So that means that people really want to have uh, constructors without complicated method bodies uh, or, or constructor bodies. And actually comes with a, a number of positive side effects for the understandability of their, of their code, like having less side effects as part of constructing instances of, of classes is a very good thing. Um, so by making this uh, easy to write, you encourage it and people um, will definitely use it. So I hope you can all read the Java code as well. It's nothing fancy, nothing uh, um, interesting about that, except that like, actually having public fields in Java is sort of frowned upon. Uh, so if you want to fix this and make this more real, you probably have to go through like, something like this, right? Adding get x and get y fields and turning the, the double fields x and y uh, into private instance fields. And uh, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's sort of intentional overflow here. It's, it, it grows, right? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Even for simple things like this, you have to write, well, this is a fairly large font, right? But it adds up. And you don't have to do that in Dart. Like the X and the Y are properties, and you can access them. And you can, of course, also overwrite them in subclass and provide a, an implementation of them that is based on something that executes real code. So this is actually, an, I think, an important thing that even the simple case looks better in Dart, but once you start using it for real, having less boilerplate makes it much more clean, clear what you're trying to express here. Another, I think, important point is oh, that... Can I just interrupt? Just of course. Uh, so you all know these programming environments for Java, and they are so helpful because if you start writing, writing your constructor and the constructor parameters take final fields, it will expand. Uh, it will add half a page of code to, to your class, and you don't have to do anything. And I understand what they, why they're doing it is to help you. But at the end of the day, right, you, you end up getting generated boilerplate code. Uh, and uh, that's just hard to change and, and, and refactor afterwards. So the less code you have in your program, the better it is in my mind. Within reason. Like, there are complicated languages where you can express just about anything in one line and maybe not the, the APL? what we're aiming for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One other important thing is that um, often when you write Java code, you find yourself sort of being forced to prepare for uh, the possibility of adding new implementations uh, at some point in the future. Uh, so you, you have to basically not write a, just a class definition. You have to, like, it's good, uh, it's good form at least to write an interface as a separate thing and then go ahead and implement that interface with a class. A lot of people f either forget it or just dislike that and you get this sort of duplication of the interfaces, even for the simple cases where you may not need it in the future. But you have to prepare for it. Um, in Dart, we decided that actually being able to treat a class as an interface, in a sense, at least allowing it to have an implied interface that you can go ahead and implement, is very useful. So that means that in Dart, you don't have to uh, worry about splitting the, the point into a Cartesian point and a point interface from the get-go. You can go ahead and add a separate class, polar point in this case, that just implements the interface of a concrete class point. And here it also shows how you can then go ahead and, and instead of materializing the x and the y 
uh, properties as fields, you can go ahead and compute them instead, and you still implement the same interface. So in a sense, this just makes it easier for a, for a programmer to avoid getting into this problem where they have to write too much stuff, write duplicate interfaces and, 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 uh, and classes, just to prepare for what might change in the future. Does that make sense? You've probably all been uh, forced in a code review to add more interfaces to your, to your stuff, and for simple things, it doesn't really help the readability. And again, this is a little bit bigger on the other side. I mean, if I were to type out all of this stuff, you would find that uh, you would not be able to read it because the font size would have to be so small. There are other things that are a little bit more sort of technical in, in its nature that, that uh, it's just a little, little bit better in, in Dart. Um, so on, on the right-hand side, I don't know how many of you are familiar with sort of the idioms that uh, are associated with turning collection types into more primitive array types in, in Java. The one problem that they have in Java is that the actual uh, type of the, of the elements in a, uh, in a collection type, like a set of string, is not reified at runtime. So the system doesn't really know that you have a set of strings, it just knows it's a set. So the system cannot really help you when you want to extract a, in this case, a primitive array of strings from a set of strings. You have to tell it by passing in a, that primitive array you want to be filled in. Otherwise, the types don't really match up and you cannot get the right runtime type out of the system. In that, we've decided to, to reify that is materialize the runtime type information that you need to be able to do this without requesting a user to pass in sort of explicitly what he wants everywhere here. Just let the set of strings know that it actually contains strings and allow a method like toList on that string to return the right kind of list of strings, not just a random list. And that really helps too in, in terms of uh, making it much easier to express these things without having to write error-prone code that ends up looking a little bit weird. I mean, I think people coming to Java from from different backgrounds would find this, this S2 array, new string, S size thing kind of convoluted and weird in terms of what it tries to express. Feels a little bit off at least. I just want to add that uh, in Java, there's a reason why they don't have that, because they could not change the JVM specification when they introduced generics. Um, so they had to do a ratio of the generic types. Mm. So the only data type in Java that have generics is a primitive Arrays, because they have reified types. Yeah. There are other things where drawing sort of a, um, a picking up good features from other languages and applying them in a, in a new context here it works out pretty well. So we have a, a notion of cascaded calls. Very often, at least in, in, in certain kinds of code, you end up calling lots of different methods on the same object. Like the trick usually is to throw that object into a, a a new local variable, and then just repeat that uh, all along. But Smalltalk had a pretty neat solution to this that allowed you to send multiple uh, messages to the same object without having to, to do that. Um, and we sort of cloned that and put that into a, 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 a C syntax and made it possible to actually, in this case, call one, two, three, four, five methods on the canvas context object um, without having to materialize that in a, in a, in a new local variable. Here, I mean, the difference if you actually went ahead and put context in a local variable probably wouldn't be that big, but we do find that people write better code and can stay within what is, a, um, a, what is sort of an expression context. You don't have to be a place where you can write statements to make this work. And it makes the code a little bit simpler, and it, it, uh, it, I think it encapsulates what the intent here is uh, even better than actually pulling out the, uh, the, the context object into a local variable. There are other places where this actually works pretty well. And that's where you, um, where you initialize uh, objects and right away want to do something to them. So in, in, uh, in Smalltalk, uh, this is a very common idiom, uh, with one twist. In Smalltalk, uh, the, uh, the evaluation of sort of a, a set of messages uh, always evaluated to the last uh, expression evaluated here. And we've decided in Dart that um, that was not really necessary, that we always wanted the overall uh, operation here to evaluate to the original uh, object you're invoking these messages on. So the code for creating a small initial set here could easily look something like this. It's a method that returns a set, and on the right-hand side you see us creating a set and right away adding the single element to it before returning it. And it works pretty well in practice, and we see a lot of people using these things for just writing slightly better code. Uh, so it's sort of encouraging people not to have to invent names for all, all the expressions that they want to reuse in this context. So it's a way of making things more concise. Does it make sense to you? Great. 
So just to sum up the cascade of things, maybe you haven't seen these things before, right? But it, it does allow you as a programmer to do sort of a chaining of methods on any kind of object with a different with a set of methods without having the APIs prepared for that. And in Java, we see a lot of people writing these sort of fluent style or method chaining style APIs where they always return uh, the uh, the object you're invoking on to be able to sort of um, just have a chain of method invocations. But that it, it looks a little bit off-putting when you look at the APIs. Like, why are the APIs always returning the object? Is that just to prepare for something where someone who wants to use the API has, uh, has a need to do this in a, in a row? It feels weird. Like, why are these methods returning this all the time. So you don't have to do that in Dart. Um, as I said, the expressions always return the receiver object, the one you're invoking the methods on, and it's uh, certainly inspired from, from Smalltalk. There are a lot of things in Dart that uh, is inspired by other languages, and I find that's the, that's, that's the best way of actually uh, building pragmatic, uh, useful languages. Um, and people generally find, this is our experience, that it's kind of easy to pick up a language like Dart because it feels very familiar. So just one more, I just want to add one more thing here. First of all, um, I hope you see a theme here. If you want to use method chaining in Java, the implementation uh, ahead of time has to be planned for it. Everything has to return this so you can do the method chaining. In Dart, you can, also, you can use that the client side on any interface. It's exactly the same as with the polar point. In Dart, you can use any class as an interface. You don't have to pre-plan for uh, for doing an extra class, whereas like in Java you have to do that. So we really believe that creating frameworks for one use case is not a good idea in software. I know many people like that, but it's a terrible idea because you don't know how the second uh, uh, client will be using that interface. So in my mind it's better to have a programming language that makes it flexible and when a second user is coming in and want to use that interface, they can use it in any way they choose to. Now let's get back to Eric. So um, this is Eric Meyer. Used to be at Microsoft. Did asynchronous uh, support in C Sharp. Has added to almost any language in the world by now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to go uh, through a small spiel how we did that in, um, in Dart. So um, I assume all of you guys that have programmed in, in JavaScript, you uh, try to block the UI thread and then everything goes to hell. Um, sometimes the browser even times you out and stops the whole web page and it's just really annoying. Uh, in Java you have multiple threads so you can always spin off another thread working on it. Uh, that's not possible if you run inside the browser for instance. So uh, the browser enforces single thread execution, and the big problem here is how do you deal with I/O uh, without uh, killing responsiveness? Because if you read something over the network, you don't know when it will return. Many people over the time have said that multi-threading is uh, is a solution, but even that is not a problem. Even that is not the solution because often when you make a new thread in a programming language, you bind it to a native thread and there's limited threads you can allocate. So in Java, uh, if you allocate much more than 10,000 threads, it starts uh, killing the machine you're running on if it's a desktop. Mm -hmm. So what is the solution? Because the code you want to have is sort of on the right. This is simplified I.O. code. It reads something and it writes it. Uh, and there can be errors. You want to handle that with a catch clause. And when you're done with the whole thing, you want to close the, uh, the streams you've been working on. So, uh, very simple. So, in the browser, where, without having real support for asynchronous programming, the simple solution is like if you used OS 9 on the Mac many, many years ago. You put down a callback, so when the I.O. operation completes, that will be called. And then you know that the I.O. operation has terminated. So in, um, here's some pseudocode that can handle uh, it. And what you do is you make a read operation that will, uh, you can pass in a closure, and that closure will be called with what was read when it happened. 
and then you can sort of do whatever you want with it. In this case, you want to write it uh, to some place, the content C, and then you also pass in an error handler, which is a callback. If something goes wrong, it will be called. Uh, please note that we don't handle, handle finally because then this becomes completely unreadable. And this is the absolute simplest case for I.O. One read, one write. Imagine if you have logic involved in this, uh, uh, then it becomes completely unreadable. So uh, smart people have come up with uh, abstractions called futures uh, to make it better. And a future is just a dumb object that can contain a closure. And the idea of the futures is that when a future completes, it will call the, uh, the stored closure on the future. And then you also have some uh, uh, library routines on a future that will help you organize your code. In this case here, you can actually handle the uh, finally clause that's on the right. And you can see you have a then catch error and when complete. It makes the code more readable especially when you have sequential uh, code, like I do a read and I do a write. If you have any, any kind of looping going on, this gets really complicated because you have to replicate all the language constructs in library for the future. So you get this duality in the, in the system that's uh, hard to, to deal with. So for those of you who are more familiar with this JavaScript, uh, just think promise when we say future and you'll be fine. Same issue, same deal. It's called a promise. I'll promise to do that in the future. Good. So, uh, so Eric Meyer just left Microsoft, so we hired him in as a consultant to make sure that our libraries were fit with a new asynchronous design. So uh, we came up, or he came up mostly, uh, with a new keyword for our language called mm -hmm. async. You can put on methods. We already have libraries that have uh, streams and futures, so that fit uh, really well into the system. The solution is inspired by C-sharp, but nowadays they, they have it everywhere. Yes. So, uh, so this is mostly for your pleasure. You probably know all of this, but uh, if you introduce the async keyword, you can come back and get some code that's almost readable. Please note that the code on the right looks like the code on the left now. We have now gone back to using try, catch, and finally. Yes, we have some awaits uh, sprinkled around. They'll say this actually can be suspended at this point in time. But the logic in the program is restored. Behind the scenes is all awful because you have to terminate an activation in mid-flight and then you have to reactivate it again when a certain future fires. So we have a compiler that compiles a method uh, into a state machine where the locals in the activation has been migrated into a heap representation. And so whenever you continue after an await, it will ba basically resume that activation. On the other hand, you get readable code. And we make the call that this is better to have readable code than a complicated implementation behind the scenes. So um, that's pros and cons with uh, async await. The pros are obvious. I talked about them. They restore the normal control flow of the application. It's super important because then you can actually maintain the code. You even have the try and finally clauses. And then you can do incremental migration of code. You can take one method at a time and convert it from a method with callbacks and futures to a, an async method. And I think that's really nice. So the compilation process only changes around one method if you have the async keyword. On the negative side, right, you get this duality between async code and sync code. And it's like const in C++, it seems to spread out. Uh, but that's sort of the drawback of it. It has more, more positive sides than negative sides. One problem is, of course, that stack traces disappear, because whenever you're at an await point, you unwind the complete stack, 
and then when you fire uh, the next future, you'll re-establish that activation. So debugging is, is not intuitive, especially when the systems uh, guys tells you that uh, if you step into an async method, there's two results. Um, anyways, people love this. And uh, so I, I'm glad we put it in, and thanks to Eric for it. So um, we have gone through a few examples here in this presentation. I hope you convinced you that having, simple, and having a simple and consistent program language is important for you to understand how the program executes. I spent too many years doing small talk, and I really, really like that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between what you see in the source code and you, what you execute when you run your program. That I leave out the async stuff. Um, but that's important. So now we'll talk a little bit about the framework. That's also important to make it simple and understandable, to make you a better programmer. Kasper? So the name of the framework we're going to give no, you this is to? Yeah, it's sort of you, but I'll, I'll take it anyway. Um, All right. It's called Flutter. Um, and we're going to just give you a, a brief overview of that, but I'm going to mess a little bit with some machines up here to actually show you a demo of this stuff running for real. Uh, so I'm going to switch over a few things here. So, so I'll do, let Lars do a bit of the talking here while I start sweating and moving machines around. So uh, I guess you, you can get a, a first taste of it while I start working on this. All right. So um, we need to freeze the frame signal here, and then we can... I'll take this. Wow. Thank you. So we have a new project at Google called Flutter. It's open source, flutter.io. And um, it's all about making uh, mobile development faster. So today, uh, when you have to do a mobile app, you first have to do it for iOS or for Android, and then make a similar app on the other side. So one of the main points of Flutter is that you can write the, the source code in uh, once, and it runs on all these devices. And Casper uh, is ready nope. for a demo. You're not. The machine is still booting, so you have to stall a little bit. But the more interesting part of this uh, framework here is all written in Dart. And it started out as a, uh, as a project uh, from the Chrome guys. Um, they wanted to make something that's simpler than the browser. So they start making a simplified DOM model and interface to that and try to build a framework on top of that. It got too complicated. So they took that out and replaced that with more Dart code. And eventually, it ends up that they only have a C++ low-level uh, graphics API. The rest is implemented in Dart. And the point is, in this uh, project here, is that when you run the debugger, all the code is in Dart. So you can see what's going on. And that is to a big contrast to most of the systems that are being implemented today. We have a demo. I'm ready now. Can we switch over to the, uh, the live HDMI? It is on. We're on. Great. Let me start this up. Here's a, um, a Flutter-based small sort of gallery app that shows you some of the things that, that Flutter can do. Um, as Lars said, almost everything here is run, written in Dart. Um, and right now, I'm actually running it here on, a, on this, this small device, uh, the iPod. And I'm just going to show you a, a few of the things be aware that the frame rate you see up here is probably not going to match what I see here. So uh, things that look really nice for me might look somewhat crappy for you guys. But you should come up here afterwards, and I'll show you the, the real live devices. So on my uh, device up here, this is super smooth, and you have to trust me on this. Just like a 60 frames per second easily. It just runs really nice, and it shows a sort of great um, uh, animation uh, frame rates and, and a very consistent uh, frame rates as well. This is all powered by Dart um, and the, the, uh, the Flutter framework. And I mean, this is a fairly simple thing, uh, but a lot of these sort of more high-level managed systems out there have a hard time delivering these very consistent frame rates. And uh, this is actually an area where, where Dart is doing really, really well. So let me go back to something that might look a little bit better even on the, on the screen here and uh, pick a let's do the uh, flexible toolbar thing here. Here's a, uh, another part of this uh, sort of gallery app that shows some of the uh, transitions that you would expect from like, modern mobile um, apps are all working in this, in this framework. So it all has a nice uh, like fluent um, feel to it. Again, like, the frame rates look really nice here, 
uh, but you can see that there's uh, some attention paid to the details, and it actually looks like a real native app. Um, the thing is that this does not just run on the, on the iPod here. If you come up here, and I'll, I can show you this on a, a different device, let me just wave it about so you get a feel for that. It actually is real. But here is the, the same thing running on an, an Android phone, same code base, same system, and it works really nicely there as well. And that is a big reason why this, uh, this works out. And of course, the other reason is the, the, is the implementation quality of the, of the Flutter framework. So what you have here and what you see is basically two uh, separate uh, phones, or in this case an iPod, running uh, a native app built uh, with a, a Flutter, Flutter stack uh, from the same uh, code base. I think this is the kind of thing that we need to make people much more productive um, in terms of delivering apps across the, at least the two major um, uh, mobile um, uh, uh, platforms. Anything you want to add? Anything you want to show? Uh, you should really drop by afterwards and, uh, and form a line and I'll show you all the, how it all works out in practice. It's much, much nicer uh, if you're not connected here. Well, we'll see how many people we can get to see it. So. Want to change back? Oh, yeah. Let's, Let's try uh, it out. All right, so this is the architectural overview of Flutter. Oh, much better. So you can see it's a layered approach. At the bottom, you have the Dart VM uh, Skia, which is the graphics library used in Chrome. You have something called Mojo, which is just a, uh, an isolation shell around it. And then you have a flow engine for text. The rest is written in Dart which is really cool. They love it because they can, all they have to debug in is in one programming language. You know, when you build a, a big system and you use different components, it could be JavaScript, Angular, and HTML, there's al always a blame game when it comes to performance. Like, these are the guys that's not performing and stuff like that, and it's never ending. The cool thing about this is um, if there's a performance problem, we can actually fix it in the, in the Dart VM to get good frame rates. And for the Flutter system, we have actually done a lot of uh, engineering in the Dart VM. We've done ahead of time compilation. We have done dynamic uh, storage of dynamically generated code on Android. So if the underlying system kills it and restarts it, you can use the code that's already compiled. And um, so this is, uh, this is a fairly good fit for the, the Dart uh, uh, program language and the VM. One thing you should know is why didn't we do this in JavaScript? You, okay, you should try to pre-compile JavaScript and come back to me then, because that's nearly impossible. JavaScript is so dynamic that uh, you cannot uh, pre-compile much. So um, this is great. You should go look at the Flutter.io uh, homepage and uh, try it out. Next page, please. Um, here's a sample application uh, from the or a sample code from, from Flutter. It's a reactive framework. And the way that works is that uh, you can see an increment. If somebody called increments, uh, set state will be called with a closure. And set state will just uh, render the system dirty. And the underlying system will call the build construct and create a new UI uh, tree. And then only uh, with a diff algorithm display what's necessary for the update. This is a very modern way of doing UIs today, and it's very clean. So um, we are very excited about uh, sending this out soon as an SDK. And we have a quote for, uh, from a fellow Googler. They just love it right now, which is good. I hope they'll continue. So um, run programming language to roll the move, uh, or rule them all. <laughs> And um, I really believe in this. And it's sort of going back to the old days where you had Lisp machines all in Lisp or Smalltalk systems all in Smalltalk. But actually, there's something to it. You, you become a much more efficient programmer. Because when you have to cross the boundary between one language and another one, 
there's always what happens in the interfacing part, and you have to change the mental model. This is actually very clean. An example on that, if you use start with Angular and HTML, it's actually very complicated to fi figure out where the time goes and who initiated what code. So, um, very good. So let me give you an update on like, where Dart is at in 2016. Like, you're probably all familiar with the fact that 2016, at least a good chunk of it, is the year of the, um, the selfie. And um, Dart is actually doing pretty well in, in, in this year. So I'm just going to give you an update on how we see it used today. And there's a lot of internal Google projects that are using it. Uh, I just want to let you know uh, a few details on, on those things. So Google Fiber, for those of you let's say, lucky enough to be in an area where you can get that. Um, it's actually using Dart for some of the uh, UI-heavy uh, stuff that they're building, and they're very happy with, with, uh, with the, uh, the benefits that they also get from Dart. Maybe our sort of most, um, the biggest uh, customer we have internally is, is the AdWords team that are rewriting the entire AdWords product, which is a very important product to Google, in Dart. Um, and this works um, from within browsers across mobile devices. Um, and it's actually being, being launched more or less as we speak, this, this new version of it, all built in Dart. So we're seeing really, really, really healthy uptake of, of the technology. Um, and we're really shipping these large, very critical web apps built in, in Dart, and there are a lot of people writing Dart code. And the reason why we, we, we see these internal teams moving to Dart is that they can actually see that they are highly productive as, as they scale upwards. And, uh, uh, one of our uh, friends there that work on, on AdWords, uh, Josie, um, was kind enough to provide a, a small testimonial for here. But I think the, the core, uh, core thing here is really that that is really in, in quite heavy use, probably more on the inside of the company than outside, but I guess part of, uh, part of the, um, the reason why we're also here is just to let you know of where we're going with this technology so you can, you can think about whether or not it fits your, your will. So, that actually runs in a lot of different places. Just to make it very clear where, where it runs, um, it runs in browsers through a translation process to JavaScript. Um, it also runs on mobile, and you sort of saw a demo, and you should definitely come up here and see it for real. Uh, but there it actually runs on top of an optimized Dart VM uh, that gives us some uh, really nice frame rates and some good uh, debugging properties as well. It runs on servers as well. We use it uh, for a lot of different things. But the, sort of the latest things that we've also sort of venturing into is a... Uh, is a plan to actually run these things on much smaller devices. IoT is probably the most famous buzzword for these things. Um, I like to think of it as embedded instead. Um, but at least we want to run Dart on small microcontrollers. Um, and it's actually working um, very well for us. It's certainly work in progress. It's not a product yet. Um, but we have Dart running uh, really well on, on small Cortex-based uh, uh, microcontrollers. Um, and it, it scales. This is not like really low-end devices at all, but it's sort of the, the high end of the low end, you could say. Uh, small devices, 32-bit microcontrollers with maybe around 100, 128 kilobytes of RAM and a, a, a good chunk of flash as well. This is where it starts getting interesting. Having a managed language that actually works well in that space, um, that gives you some of the benefits and the productivity benefits uh, in particular um, that we see for like, desktop and, and mobile, on these small devices is a very powerful thing. Well, we're not the first to have tried this. It's been done in the past. Like, they probably have some war stories to share with you. Um, but it feels like the market right now is, um, in terms of hardware capabilities, it's, it's really getting there. And the, the difference in price between a, a chip that can run a high-level uh, managed language like that and one that cannot is really, really shrinking quite dramatically these days. So it feels like this is actually a pretty good uh, fit for that. One thing that's really important to stress here is and, uh, the embedded space is a very interesting space. Lots of um, closed software stacks that you cannot really get access to unless you pay like, a very high premium. It's still like developer seed licenses, and it's a very sort of old school model for it. We're going for uh, the, the more modern approach with an open source uh, sort of alternative to, uh, to those um, systems. Uh, and uh, even though that some people find that uh, um, sort of a, an interesting change. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's highly critical that we, uh, we, we get much more uh, open and much more accessible stacks out there that people can really use. So it's, um, it's certainly an attempt to also improve software for embedded devices in general. So I think we're getting close to the end. Yep. How are we on time? That looks good. We started early. Oh, I see. All right, so let's uh, try to conclude uh, before we have questions. So, um, 
we believe we did the, after spending 25 years doing VMs, uh, we got fed up, did a new program language, and we think we have learned from the past. We think it's readable and it's concise, and uh, I think you should try it out if you haven't. Um, we heard from other projects that like it, which is nice. And we already have several million lines of code of Dart written inside Google. And uh, the good thing about that is that it means this is not a fluke. Uh, Dart is going to be around for a long time, so get used to it. Um, so, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. so we created the uh, uh, Casper and I created Dart, and I think we are. Uh, we at least have an attempt to make something that's more concise. Um, so that's good. And uh, we hope you like it too. So um, let's go to the questions. Do we have any questions from, uh, from the, the audience here? Yeah, if yeah. not, I have a good list here of uh, questions that you all sort of well, tapped like, in. Like questions are, are really good. So please take a mic if you want to ask questions about VMs or languages. Oh, I don't have a question about that, sorry. I wanted to ask a quick question about Flutter, even though I could probably look this up. I'm just wondering what the current support is for the, the native APIs, such as interfacing with Bluetooth, accelerometer, et cetera, et cetera. So the um, Flutter apps are native apps, so they, um, they have access to all the same native capabilities as any other native app. Um, and there's a little bit of plumbing that you have to do to, uh, to make that available in Dart, but it's certainly possible to access anything from the underlying system by uh, so basically having interrupt with uh, Java on Android and, uh, and Objective-C yeah. and Swift on, uh, on iOS. So. Well, this is where it gets tricky, because you don't want to use too much platform-specific code, because then it doesn't work on both. So you have to make sure that when you do... Uh, uh, like the Compass interface to that, right? You want to make sure that you use the same API and provide two implementations so people can take advantage of a common API on, on the two systems. But that is the int intent. I actually have a question for you here, Lars. Um, it's sort of for me as well, but it says, like, V8 is very impressive. Do you feel any guilt for inflicting the world's worst, most painful language on the planet? I, I didn't make this up. The last part of that question, um, I've been told not to say from my own mouth because that gets me into problems. But um, you have, uh, I have an excuse here because when we started on uh, on V8 in 2006, it was um, JavaScript was mostly used for uh, describing an action when you push the button. It was very simple. A com competing browser would do a full garbage collection for each 1,000 object allocations. So the recommended style of programming was to do an object pool uh, for your whole app. So it was pretty pitiful. Um, do I regret it? It's, um, I don't like inflicting pain. Uh, and you never know how a system will be used. I think it's amazing what people can do with JavaScript today. Uh, given the fact that people are doing preprocessors uh, or transpilers on top of JavaScript, makes it bearable to many uh, big organizations to use it. Um, there's a reason why I did that, is that uh, when we looked into the specification of JavaScript, we got horrified, and you saw some examples in the talk. Um, I think that most people do not understand the, the core semantics of JavaScript, and that makes you a bad programmer. If you understand this, the core semantics of programming the language you're using, you will become better, and you will trust the underlying system. So I think um, we learned our lesson is the answer. Next. I think that's a pretty good, good answer. So my question is sort of an extension of what she asked. Uh, so a framework like Ionic uses Cordova to translate uh, code to the native platform. Mm -hmm. Does Dart use something similar to do that? If Dart uses a... Like a wrapper framework like Cordova or PhoneGap to actually translate code to uh, no, the, the native mobile platforms. 
for uh, the Flutter framework, there is no sort of translation process involved there. Um, so it, it's basically um, there is some some work being done by well, mostly the Flutter team at this point to expose these APIs in a uh, in a in a mostly platform specific way, but um, to just avoid papering over important details in this thing. Uh, but uh, there is no um, sort of a um, sort of regular way of, of doing this in a, in a more general way right now. So, but one of the important things to realize is that the Flutter stack does allow you to do these things yourself as well. So that if there are APIs you really need to hook up to, it's certainly doable. Um, okay. We can take one more from, the, uh, from, from here, I guess. Take the Dart versus TypeScript, that's fun. Dart versus TypeScript thoughts. Well, thoughts, I guess that's pretty easy. Yeah, lots of thoughts. Yes. I think Dart and TypeScript certainly uh, are trying to solve some of the same issues, but they have very, we have different approaches to, to this. Um, uh, I think if you dive into the details, in many ways TypeScript is still JavaScript with some very, very nice uh, additional features that makes tooling much better and makes uh, it possible to at least a part of your app have a, a um, sort of a, a much better uh, understanding of what's happening at runtime through the static type annotations. In, in that respect, Dart and TypeScript are very, very alike. But if you dive into the details, there are a lot of differences as well. And you could say that Dart is a little bit more ambitious, right? We wanted to fix things like not um, just giving you weird issues when you try to read uh, sort of out, out of bounds from an array. We actually give you a proper error when you do that. That doesn't happen in TypeScript. And there are a lot of other details where the implicit value uh, coercion that you saw before happens just as they should in, in TypeScript because it's based on JavaScript. In Dart, we actually check these things to make sure you're not burned by that at runtime. So there are a lot of places where we just, in some ways, took the, uh, maybe the more difficult approach of trying to solve these fundamental issues and guard you, uh, well, anyone in here that wants to use Dart at least, uh, from some of these issues at, at runtime. So I think, I mean, clearly there's overlap in, in the technology space here. Um, but at least personally, I find that there's also lots of differences that only become very visible if you really look into the details here. So one, one thing I want to mention is uh, that TypeScript is actually a, a, an interesting language. And if you, if you program only in TypeScript, it will help you make you a better programmer. But you can, you can fall into JavaScript at any point in time and then hell is loose. Right, but it means that you can you, you can manipulate the underlying model, remove properties and whatnot, change prototypes on the fly, and then the guarantees of TypeScript will not hold. So I think if you keep within the the area of, of TypeScript, you can actually have a fairly decent system. In Dart, you cannot break out into JavaScript. There's no unsafe part of Dart. And if that matters to you. Uh, then I think uh, Dart is a, is a better option. And then it, then it runs outside the browser. Yes? How's the performance um, versus the JVM? That's a good question. So the question is, how is the Dart performance on the Dart VM compared to the JVM? Um, that depends. Um, there's different Java systems out there. My favorite one is Hotspot, but the, and this, I think it's still the fastest one. Um, I hope so. The um, Dart is uh, same speed or even faster when it comes to inlining of abstractions and so on. There's a big uh, difference between Dart and, um, and Java on a fundamental level in that in Java you have basic types. In the bytecodes of uh, Java, you have specified whether it's an int or a double or stuff like that. We don't have that in Dart. And certainly, that uh, more flexibility can cost you. So if you do matrix multiplication, say you, you have to bind all the implementation types to a certain thing, Dart will be slower. But for a normal application programmer, it's just as fast or even faster sometimes. And we decided when we did that, and this is, uh, again, I was annoyed by writing C, C and C++. When I overflowed an integer, it will silently just get the wrong number. And like, what, what, is, what world are we living in? So in that, we have everything will overflow to big nums when you use it as it should be. So you preserve the integer semantics when using it. It's just, I cannot believe most programmers, they don't even do that. And there, JavaScript is actually wonderful. It, it doesn't have integers. 
Um, should we go on? Yeah, I think we probably have time for... We have one more question. One more question? Want to take it from the audience? Yeah? So for the Dart, uh, from the client-side perspective, you say it has no connections to JavaScript. So what is the browser support if, in terms of different devices? And so, so maybe we can clarify the answer. Um, so there is, certainly is a way for Dart code to call out into JavaScript. You just cannot sort of mix it in. Inside a Dart method, you will not find bits and pieces of JavaScript floating around in there. So there is a much clearer split between the Dart parts and the JavaScript parts. But you're right, in terms of writing software that runs in a browser, you need access to existing JavaScript functionality, that's one thing, but also just all the browser APIs need to be exposed in a... In a and they're available way. as Dart libraries, by the way, in the browser. But you cannot take a third-party JavaScript blob and suck into your Dart program and, and, and just use, because there's impedance mismatch between the Dart programming language and the JavaScript programming language. So you, you need to do some interfacing. I think, I think that's it. That's it. Yeah. Thank you very much for showing up.